I think it is clear to believe in the power of ideas. Fresh thinking of the Manhattan Institute. This is a very good evening. Uh, I'm Amity Schles, uh, the Manhattan Institute. <laughs> and I welcome you to the ninth annual Hayek Prize for Books. Joining our live audience here in New York, our viewers from C-SPAN Book TV, and we welcome you too. Who was Friedrich von Hayek? Born in Austria, Hayek was an economist who had first worked on business cycle theory or monetary theory, but later Hayek came to emphasize a key insight, prices are important, free prices are messengers. When free, prices tell us more about an economy than any authority could. At the London School of Economics, Hayek began to focus on whether social planning by such authorities, bureaucrats, actually works. And in the 30s, 1940s, 1950s, our nation's leaders were drawing precious lines to carefully differentiate between political systems. Here in the US, for example, we insisted there was a great difference between Russian communism and German dictatorship or between Russian and Chinese dictatorship. And most crucial of all to us was the difference between these dictatorships and our own free society in America. What Hayek showed was that our own US democracy was not so far away from dictatorship either. He published a book called The Road to Serfdom. It said we could get to dictatorship in incremental, unnoticed steps, small expansions of government, adding a little here and there, and pretty soon you got all the way down the road and were in serfdom. Hayek said that one of the forces propelling us down the road was arrogance of academics and political leaders, that there was, as he called it, a pretense of knowledge among political leaders that causes each leader to undertake absurd and tragic projects to get dizzy with success. As Hayek put it, man's fatal striving to control society, a striving that makes him not only tyrant over his fellows, but also makes him a destroyer of civilization. At first, Hayek debated other economists about this. Russ Roberts, who is here tonight, has made a wonderful, popular, viral video about his debates with John Maynard Keynes. But eventually, his trade turned its back on Hayek for these insights. The courage it took him, this economist, to continue in the wilderness is hard to imagine. Today, we watch the debate between Paul Krugman of Princeton and Ken Rogoff of Harvard, um, what happened to Hayek would be the equivalent of Mr. Rogoff, so esteemed going into the wilderness. Yet Hayek persevered by creating communities of his own, community, little lights, little places to meet again, and those communities begat other communities of which the Manhattan Institute is one. The prize was created by the Institute with donor Thomas Smith with the specific purpose of highlighting the relevance of Hayek. It is only nine years old and it has already become one of the most important prizes in America. It is the other Pulitzer. This is the classical liberal Pulitzer. Uh, past winners include Matt Ridley for the value of spontaneous order in economic recovery. Um, John Taylor of Stanford, who is here tonight, Ben Steele and Manuel Hines for a seminal book on monetary sovereignty, Bill Easterly for a book about the tragedy of aid in Africa. Many people and institutions work to bring us to tonight's prize. They include the Manhattan Institute, led by Lawrence Moan. Also, we had a friend in Human Rights Watch, 
and its executive, Minky Warden. Um, the Bush Institute, where I work, contributed some ideas. Publicist Sandy Schultz, translator Stacy Mosher, Rose Tang, an interpreter who is a star dissident and journalist in her own right. This year's jury, most of whom I'm proud to say are here tonight, uh, George Malone, um, Roger Kimball, Lawrence Moan, James Pearson, Steve Forbes, Russ Roberts, John Taylor here, and Kim Dennis worked hard to select among many, many fine books. I'd like to read the names of the finalists. Lawrence Wright wrote a wonderful book, The Clash of Economic Ideas, with much material regarding this, this intellectual history we're discussing. Anne Applebaum for Iron Curtain, a book about a real road to serfdom, that of Eastern Europe. Angus Bergen for The Great Persuasion, wonderful book as well, which gives new insight into Hayek the man I found and just won the Merle Curdy Award this week. Steve Moore for Who's the Fairest of Them All, a piercing look at our debate about income distribution and what wealth is. And Alan Meltzer for a shining book on uh, a primer on capitalism called Why Capitalism. To introduce the winner, uh, we have the honor of inviting last year's winner, the author of First Principles, John Taylor, Stanford professor and former undersecretary at the Treasury. Um, to me, Mr. Taylor is the man who best personifies the kind of collegiality and civility um, that e economic discussion, free discussion, requires but does not always feature. And with this, I, I'd like to welcome Mr. Taylor to come up. Thank you very much, Amity. It's a, a great honor for me to introduce tonight's uh, book writer and winner of the Hayek Prize, Yan Ji Sheng, and this amazing book, Tombstone. I first read Tombstone as a member of the selection committee for the Hayek Prize. I downloaded it on my Kindle, along with some of the other good books, and started reading. I first read about Mr. Yang Shen when he was a teenager. He went back to his home from school. His home turned out to be a ghost town. The bark stripped off the trees. The roots pulled up from the ground. The water drained from the ponds. And his father starving to death in the house. At the time, he thought it was an isolated incident. Only over time did he realize that tens of millions of people died in a similar fashion in China because of a terrible government policy. The next thing I read about in the book was something called the Xinjiang Incident. This was about people torturing other people because they spoke out and said that the predictions of extraordinary agricultural yields were too large. And those predictions are what led to the state to take grain from the farmers that grew it and basically let many of those farmers starve to death. It was just such an example of misinformation. It's exactly the kind of things that you're concerned about. And you also read about in this, in this province, in this area, and on province, about the so-called backyard steel furnaces, which were nothing more than people taking their walks and melting them in their temple bells and melting them and creating ball bearings which could not possibly work. And the most terrible part, these stories, detailed stories of cannibalism and how that actually occurred. And you read also about what life was like in a communal kitchen, where at the beginning people came and gorged themselves because everything was free. And then in a matter of months, the food was gone and they start to starve. And they can't go back to their homes because their pots are gone, their utensils are gone. And there's these gigantic walks in these communal kitchens, which are so big they require so much fuel that they had to clear cut the forests. And what does the government do? What does the state do? They blame it on right opportunists. They blame it on the weather. These are the things that are so adequately and so detailed described in that book. And what is Hayek? What's this got to do with Hayek? 
Jumping out of virtually every page, every page of this book is a well-researched, unforgettable case of just the kind of things that Hayek warned about in his writings. There's the pretense of knowledge of these political leaders. That they could forget about the family. That they could forget about individual initiative and end up causing 36 million people to die of starvation. The mother of all unintended consequences. There is the abandonment of the notion of prices that provide information, that provide incentives, that provide signals, and replacing them basically with command and control. And there's this amazing suppression of free speech, which is repressed by unbelievable torture, gross violations of the rule of law, and which permits these horrible tragedies to continue with basically silence. And these are the kind of things that, that I wrote about. People compared, and I, I agree with this comparison, the Young Shing's book, um, Tombstone, in many respects, has analogies with Susan Easton's Gulag Archipelago. Two, in, two insiders writing about secret tragedies and documenting them in ways that remove all possibility of any reasonable disagreement about them. It's exactly what you see when you read the details of this book. I understand that the gulag is now required in some schools in Russia. I hope that tombstone is required in schools in China as soon as possible. You know, I also hope they're required in schools in the United States. I, tombstone required in schools in the United States would be important. I remember maybe a decade after this terrible famine that academics, people I knew, would be still espousing a Maoist approach in the face of this incredible tragedy. I teach Economics One, the freshman course at Stanford, and it's so hard to teach these Hayekian ideas of rule of law and, and the advantages of economic freedom. Tombstone is filled with stories that are unforgettable that illustrates those points. I also want to introduce uh, Russ Roberts, who's a good friend, and he's going to interview uh, Mr. Young and uh, interpreted by Rose Tong. Uh, couldn't be a better person to interview anybody, even remotely close to economics issues. Russ is the best economic interviewer out there. He also puts his interviews up on the, on the net, Econ Talk. He, he blogs at Cafe Hayek. How to get more appropriate than that. He tweets, of course, at Econ Talker. And as Amity said, he produces multi-million hit videos that illustrate many important things about Hayek and his debate with Keynes. Mr. Young, welcome, and thank you for all that you have done. It's an honor to be here tonight and to have the opportunity to interview Mr. Yang about this remarkable book. Uh, we're going to talk for a little bit between the two and a half of us, the three of us. <laughs> and uh, then we're going to open it up to your questions. So as we're talking up here, have in mind uh, questions you might want to ask Mr. Yang. So I want to begin with the title of the book. The title of the book is Tombstone. So please explain why you gave that title to the book. There, there are four reasons for um, uh, naming uh, this book Tombstone. The first Reason is that I'd like to erect a tombstone for those who died. The second reason is uh, uh, to erect a tombstone 
for my father who died in starvation. Uh, the third reason to erect um, a tombstone is that I want to erect a tombstone before uh, the downfall of the system that caused the Great Famine. <laughs> The fourth reason, actually, uh, uh, this tombstone is also for myself, uh, because uh, I knew it was a dangerous job to uh, write a book like this, so I erected a tombstone for myself, in case, just in case. Uh, just to quote an ancient Chinese saying, of, who would be afraid of dying? I'm not. Happens to all of us. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's best to live, live a full life rather than a, a frightened one. So, and we are, we are grateful for your courage. So, so tell the story, it's a very sad story, of how you discovered the famine and how it affected your family. I was in the second year of my senior high school. Uh, it was the spring of 1959. Uh, so um, I, uh, my high school, which, which was the only school in the, the county, um, uh, was uh, 10 kilometers away from my village. A childhood friend uh, came uh, to my school and told me that my father was dying. And asked me to uh, take some rice back home to visit my father. So uh, I, I went to the uh, student cafeteria asking them to stop my ration. <laughs> of food for three days, so I could take 1.5 kilo, uh, uh, kilos of rice back to my dad. So for students at those schools, public schools, we were guaranteed some food. So uh, after I, I gave my father uh, uh, the rice, and my father urged me to leave. So I, I went out uh, to the fields and dug out some uh, wild vegetables and uh, uh, gave him those wild vegetables, then I left. And then um, I did not realize my, uh, my father was um, in such a serious condition. He could not eat uh, the rice at all. And uh, he, he knew he was dying, so he, he urged me to leave. And then he told his uh, neighbors uh, that um, uh, don't tell um, me the news of my death, uh, uh, of his death. Uh, until he, he passes away. I, I, I didn't return home uh, uh, again uh, uh, until a few days later when my childhood friend came with the bad news. I went back um, and, um, and my, my, my father was already dead. But you did not realize at the time that this was a wider problem. Uh, 
，我要野菜，我父亲不支持我死。I blame myself. I thought、um, my father's death was an individual case,、um, and、uh, I, I thought it was because. Uh, I, I was in my school in the county, away from home, so I, I was not around to dig out wild veggies to feed him. When did you realize that this was a big problem and not just a problem in your village? 就是说，呃呃，你什么时候呃觉得这是一个更普遍的问题？不光是你们村里，这叫很长的时间，叫很长的时间。Took me a long time. 一直到文化革命中间。Not until in the middle of the Cultural Revolution. Then, the Senator Zhang Tixue, who is Hubei State Senator, said, "I said that I'm 30,000 people in Hubei State. That's Hubei State. That's what he told you. He didn't say it to 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 you. He didn Uh, uh, my province, the Hubei province, was criticizing the party secretary of the uh, uh, of the Hubei province, um, blaming uh, uh, him, and uh, that was the time when it disclosed. Uh, you so don't. Um, uh, disclosed the uh, uh, the figure uh, that um, three hundred thousand people had died of uh, starvation in that province alone. And was that number accurate? This thirty thousand, this accurate? Is it small? 可能湖北省死过五六十万人吧。Much less, actually. Than and what was the real number? 那是真的，那那个呃数字是多少？呃，估计数字五六十万，六十五六十万。我书上有这个湖北省的数字。I as I wrote in my book, uh, uh, I estimated the figure at uh somewhere between five hundred thousand and six hundred thousand. But that was only in your province. So, in the nation. 嗯，只是湖北嘛。湖北省。In the nation, what is our best estimate? Of how many people died in the famine? Uh, 就是说全国的话，呃，你大概估计是全国三千，我是说是三千六百万。My estimate uh, for the whole China, the、uh, those who died in、uh, starvation would be、uh, 36 million. 36 million, unbelievable, incredible, incredible tragedy. 不可思议，不可思议，是很大的一个悲剧。So many people think of famine. As being caused by a bad harvest. 好好好多人都呃都怪了这个饥荒啊，实际上是就是呃收成不好。But but this case, you blame political forces. Explain what caused the famine and the starvation and the tragedy. 但是你在书中啊，你是实际上你是批判了这个政治制度。你觉得是这？你能不能多讲一下这政治制度是个原因？当时你为了是官方说是因为天灾造成饥荒。The official explanation was that it was caused by natural disasters. 为了解决这个问题，我多次去国家气象局查当年天灾的气象历史。To to 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 solve this mystery, I I went to the National Bureau of Meteorology and did a lot of research. 我的结论是天灾年年有，有国家很大。这三年是平常年景，正常年景；天灾年年有，三年是常年，正常年景。三年的天灾。三年是很正常的气候。Okay. So my my conclusion was that、uh, sure there were natural disasters every year, but those three years, uh, the the climate climate was normal. The climate was normal in 1958, 1959, 1960, 61. 五八五九，五八五九六零，这三年。Fifty eight, fifty nine, and sixty. And so was it the climate? 这不是气候了。啊，不是气候。不是气候，气候，不是没有天灾，是有天灾。中国这么大，年年都有天灾。You know, China. China is big. It's not that I didn't mean that China did not have any natural disasters. No, I understand. In those years, yeah, it's normal. So what went wrong? Why? Why was there so much starvation? 就是说，是哪儿出了问题了？为什么这个死这么多人？就是造造成几千万人死亡的，把毛泽东这个领导集团，呃，他们并不是魔鬼，也不是傻瓜。不是魔鬼，也不是傻瓜。嗯、也不是傻瓜。The the leadership clique, uh, under the leadership of Mao, that caused 
uh, the uh, starving deaths of several uh, uh, tens of millions of people, um, they were not fools, but they were not evil either. They, they, had, they had very sublime ideals, and they're very efficient revolutionaries. So they, they just thought uh, 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 by, uh, by designing the system, by uh, putting the whole nation under a collective uh, economy, uh, they could bring great results. They, they designed a paradise, and they wanted to take all Chinese to this paradise. So they stripped off uh, everybody's freedom that way. N nobody uh, had the freedom to find food, uh, uh, to, grow food. To, their, to, grow, uh, to grow them and to find food uh, according to their own efforts. But they also, so they collectivized, they collectivized farming. Yes, they took did. away the incentives to grow. They dismantled uh, uh, individuals and uh, households, individual households, as uh, production units. But there was grain in the agricultural areas, but it got sent away, correct? So actually the grain production uh, uh, experienced uh, 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 the grain uh, uh, production uh, uh, was uh, reduced by a huge amount because they took away the incentive, as you said, uh, of production. But they also took it away, the grain itself, correct? They took it into the cities. So the, the government simply took, took away the harvest, the yields, uh, all of it. Put it together. Then they redistribute it to uh, people. And it reminds me of the tragedy in the Soviet Union of the Ukraine. Very similar had things happened. Right? Yes, Very similar. Yes, yes. And so while the famine was going on, while the famine was going on, it was very hard to get information about what was happening. And the government tried to suppress the knowledge. Correct? Uh, the local uh, officials, uh, they, they only praised, they were full of praises of Mao's policies, and they, they only uh, said good words about the, uh, what was happening. And, and they bragged, they bragged as well. And, and they, they, they bragged about the situation. They said we had this huge surplus of grains. Of course. And actually, uh, Mao, Mao Zedong was very worried about this huge surplus. Yeah. Um, now, people who tried to spread the knowledge about the famine to other people, what happened uh, to them in the beginning? They were not allowed to spread such information. 
they were not even allowed, uh, for example, in Xinyang, in Henan province, uh, as mentioned by John Ta Taylor, Mr. Taylor, that uh, uh, people in Xinyang, in that county, they were not allowed to write letters. Xinyang the, the government of Xinjiang actually they uh, confiscated, they held um, twelve thousand letters from people. Where people they were, were trying to write to, about they, horrible things that had to, happened. They were not posted. The post office worked with the public uh, security bureau, the, the police. They held those letters. Those who were sent uh, from above uh, to visit Xinyang, they were not allowed. Xinyang, uh. So when the officials were sent above to visit Xinyang, and the peasants in Xinyang were told uh, to walk uh, uh, straight up with a straight back, and they are not even allowed to uh, use walking canes. So I'm going to read a quote from the book which to me captures the incentives of this kind of political system and why evil and disastrous effects can spread. If you didn't beat others, you would be beaten. The more harshly you beat someone, yeah, as I wrote in the book, uh, those who died in the famine, uh, sure, some of them died in starvation, but some, some people were simply beaten to death. For trying to eat, to trying to get food, right? To try to spread the information. Yeah, when, when, when the peasants try to get some, some crops, something to eat from the fields, they were beaten. When they asked the, uh, the officials and the village chiefs and the accountants for some, uh, some food to eat, they got beaten up too. And, uh, uh, and some local, local uh, government officials, they got beaten up to death as well. And you write, if you didn't beat others, you were a right deviationist. Uh, and would soon be beaten by others. Uh, so yes. it's very hard to be a good person in such a world. Yes. And so good people either went quiet, right? Or became bad people. Yeah, they would have been beaten up if they disobeyed. And they got the uh, the food. Uh, which was meant to be allocated to them, and they would get that uh, uh, that quota reduced or taken away. Because none of the families were allowed to cook at home, everybody uh, had to eat in the commune uh, cafeteria. So many people, they, they were just waiting at the gate, at the front door of this uh, commune, <coughs> A cafeteria, the kitchen, uh, they were not allowed to go in to eat, and they literally fall down to death in starvation. So in your book, you describe as a young man that you were an idealist, you were a good communist, and yet at the same time, you describe the fear that people had of the government. I'm curious how you reconciled those two forces, idealism and support for the system, with the fear that the system intimidated and scared people and sometimes killed them. Mm -hmm. 
，但是呢，也对发生了很多事情啊，政府也充满了恐惧。你是怎么调和这个矛盾的？当时我们那一代人的时候，下面下面灌输的就是一种思想，共产主义、毛泽东思想。So at at that time, my generation that we've been brainwashed with one belief. Which was communism? That was the only. 只有一种信息，就政府想让我们知道的，我们就知道；政府不想让我们知道，我们就不知道。The only information available to us was the information the government wanted us to to know. 对跟政府看法不一致的人就受到打击。So those who disagreed with the government were persecuted. 所以一方面，因为我们没有别的信息，因为共产主义是真实美好的，所以我们相信共产主义。So I, on one hand. Uh, we did not have other information, and we really believed in communism, and we really believed communism was great. 同时，呃，对那些非共产主义思想，爱批判，我们也感到恐惧。I, I, I, on the other hand, uh, we're really afraid and frightened, uh, uh, when we witnessed the persecution of those non-communist thoughts. 这种恐惧感是，呃，充满了整个社会，是家长让孩子。The sense of fear was ever everywhere, even down to from how the parents educated children. Their principle of education, educating their children, is to teach them how to obey. If you have a self-centered view of the government, you will feel fear and anxiety immediately. Even if I I had uh, any thoughts, uh, uh, any disagreement uh, in my mind, disagreement with the government in my mind, and immediately I would feel the fear, and I would stop such thoughts. So, so there came a point when you realized that something very very bad had happened in China's past, this famine, and you started to realize that. Things had been very bad, very wrong. Were you afraid to write this book? So, you, you, if you, you, later, you, 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 that, that's uh, in my explanation uh, of uh, erecting uh, this tombstone for myself. Yes, I, I had this. But we're in a new century. Things are different. So if, if I had written this book 30 years ago, I would have been uh, ex executed. I, I, I would, if I had written this book 20 years ago, I would have been in jail. Even though I'm not facing any execution or possible jail term um, uh, right now, but uh, I, uh, the, there's this still fear of uh, being marginalized, being persecuted. Well, we thank you again for your courage. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit, change a little bit, and talk a little bit about Hayek. Um, as, as John Taylor said, uh, this book illustrates many Hayekian principles. One of the most important is the idea that experts can steer an economy from the top down and plan things and understand how things are going to turn out. And I'm going to give my favorite Hayek quote, and I'll give Rose a chance to translate it. So first you can pass that quote, and then I'll give the quote. Yes. Now I'm going to talk about Hayek. 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 So Hayek wrote, the curious task of economics is to demonstrate to men how little they really understand about what they imagine 
they can design. And I would love for that quote to spread through China in any language. <laughs> but the point of that quote, the curious task of economics is to demonstrate to men how little they really understand about what they imagine they can design. And it's one way of capturing what John Taylor mentioned about the unimaginable, unintended consequences of this kind of tragedy. 这些专家人们呢他们自以为是他们以为可以设计一个系统但是他们不知道他能够做的有多非常非常少他说他很希望就是这一句话在中国广为传播就是精英们总认为自己精英啊精英们或者政治领导人呐或专家们总认为自己能
and uh, what they were thinking, each, each individual's thoughts were controlled by the government. So, in the government, that's why I call, call it a totalitarianism, because it, that's when the power expanded to the very extreme. Now, Hayek argued in a totalitarian system, the worst people rose to the highest ranks. Was that true in the 1950s in China, do you think? At that time, under such totalitarian, in this totalitarianism system, those who obeyed orders, they they were promoted. Those who disagreed, they were demoted or persecuted. So even the very high ranks, people get promoted. So the, we're talking about the slaves were promoted, and the real talents uh, were limited and uh, demoted. So when did you first discover Hayek? For a long time, uh, uh, none of Hayek's books were translated into Chinese. Uh, in China, until in 1962, a professor from the uh, prestigious Nanka University translated it. And of course, in his translation, uh, any mentioning of Nazism uh, and communism, the comparison of the two uh, was deleted. Even for uh, such censored trans translation, uh, it was only translated for top leaders as internal reference, not for the public. But you have the road to serfdom right there, right? This copy uh, was published in 1997. Mm -hmm. At that time, I was researching on the Great Famine. Uh, through this book, I deepened my understanding of the Great Famine. Uh, on the other hand, my research on the Great Famine deepened my understanding of Hayek. And are people aware of Hayek in China today? But the economists know. Uh-huh. Now, we're going to ask Mr. Yang one last question, and then I'm going to open it up to, to, to your questions. But Mr. Yang has told me before that he doesn't want to talk about American politics. But I am going to. I, 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 I don't know American politics right. much. So I'm just going to ask you a question about Chinese economics, which is, which is that in the early 2000s, you wrote about Chinese stimulus packages and Keynesian economics. So I'd like to hear your opinion of the impact of Keynesian policies in China. We're not going to talk about the United States, not his area. <laughs> John Taylor is here for people who are interested later. But in China, Keynesian policies were put in place. There was a lot of building and investment. What happened? Uh, 
the, the for, for, former uh, Premier Zhu Rongji was uh, in office back then in the uh, late 1990s when the Asian uh, financial crisis happened. So through uh, issuing government bonds, they, uh, uh, they accumulated the money and then they, they conducted the government uh, uh, investments. In, in real estate, buildings, right? Railways as well. Railways. Just, uh, uh, yeah, properties. So called infrastructure, if I might choose an American word. And how did it turn out? China avoided the uh, Asian financial crisis. But there was a problem. But but it left uh, a lot of hidden problems in Chinese economy. And I think you've said that some people became addicted to Keynesian economics. Um, I, I was really worried about the, uh, uh, the government uh, relying on uh, uh, Keynesian e economics too much, so I wrote an article uh, with this title, uh, The Dependence on uh, Keynesianism. Uh, at the beginning, uh, Premier Zhu Rongji said, uh, oh, just a temporary policy for two or three years. But five years later, they are still doing it, and even now, they're still doing it. So that's why uh, five years after he started uh, such Keynesian uh, economics, uh, and I wrote that article, and uh, I, I warned them. I said, look, you know, you, the government is addicted. And of course, Premier Zhu Rongji was not very happy about it. <laughs> so uh, one time, uh, when he was meeting a dozen uh, economists, I was not at present. He, he held up the, my article and asked those economists, uh, who's this Yang Jishen? Uh, then uh, one of the economists, and the name was uh, Wu Jinlian, a top economist, uh, he said, uh, uh, yes, that's Yang Jishen. Uh, Yang Jishen is a senior uh, economic uh, commentator with Xinhua News Agency. And, and, and said, uh, he's very objective. And protected me. <laughs> May I yeah. So I was not persecuted. Mm. Well, any man who can oppose Keynesian economics is a Hayekian in my book. So um, let's, yes, let's thank Mr. Yang. <laughs> and, uh, and I can't help but note that it is a rather remarkable thing that Mr. Yang's appreciation for emergent order and the Hayekian principles of complexity uh, really, as he said, interacted with both his understanding of the famine, helped him understand Hayek, and Hayek helped him understand the famine. And now let's, a uh, question. We're going to let uh, a microphone come to the, please wait till the microphone comes to you. Uh, thank you for your insights. Speaking of China today, uh, as you may know, standard measures of economic freedom by the Fraser Institute, by Heritage Wall Street Journal, say that there has been a dramatic increase in economic freedom in China over the last 30 years, and that this has been accompanied by a tangible improvement in the standard of living. Uh, do you think that both those things are true, both that there has been progress in economic freedom over the last 30 years, an increase in the standard of living, 
uh, over the last 30 years that is very tangible and uh, very noticeable? And second, uh, do you have an optimistic outlook for China over the, over the next 20, 30 years? Uh, do you believe that progress uh, is, will continue for China, if indeed you believe that progress has been occurring? We've seen huge progress um, in China's economy over the last 30 years, of course. Yeah, the average growth rate of G uh, GDP uh, over the last 30 years has been uh, around an average of 9.8%. Uh, that, that's why uh, China is uh, the world's number two economy. Uh, and uh, the living standards of Chinese of different levels um, uh, have been uh, raised. Uh, and we've seen huge changes in rural China and urban China. Uh, and such huge changes are much bigger than any changes in America. Since my first visit to New York uh, in 1995, I haven't seen much change. <laughs> the drinks are getting smaller. <laughs> Hard to notice. <laughs> For example, uh, the, the high speed rail uh, uh, that's been built uh, between uh, Tianjin and Beijing, it only, it only takes one thirty minutes to travel several hours to travel on high-speed rail from Beijing to Shanghai. But traveling from Washington, D.C. Uh, to uh, New York, uh, the train is very slow. <laughs> <laughs> and the Wi-Fi is mediocre. <laughs> uh, we have time for one more question here in the front. Sorry, Sorry not yet. But there are, uh, there are deep problems. Uh, in China's economy. Because such growth really is mainly from government investments. Of course, we see, we, we see the rapid uh, growth, uh, uh, the, the, the rapid increase of uh, the GDP uh, growth rate. Uh, but a lot of these investments have been wasteful. <coughs> And uh, the uh, production ca uh, uh, capac uh, capability of manufacturing uh, sector uh, has sur uh, surpasses and, and uh, more, much more than the demand from the market. And a lot of machineries and equipment uh, are lying there idle. And the products. And they, 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 they're having a lot of uh, 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 products being stored away and cannot be sold. So, but the thing is, uh, such idle, not used equipment, uh, machinery, and those goods, those products which have not been uh, sold and sitting in the warehouses, they are also included in the GDP. And uh, this is the result of uh, government investments. Uh, it wouldn't be like this if uh, the investments were mainly from individuals, from people. So the government has been doing, what they've been doing is to uh, increase the scale. But in, in, instead of raising the uh, standards of uh, science and technology. Reason number one. 
The second uh, reason is to keep the wages low. So the uh, so with the increase of GDP, uh, we see the reduction of uh, workers' wages. And uh, the, the third reason is that uh, uh, all this GDP growth came at a price of the destruction of the environment and the resources, the exhaustion of the resources, natural resources. Yeah, and then we, we, we see this uh, 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 widespread uh, uh, the, the, the wastes uh, from the factories uh, into the environment without uh, uh, building any uh, environmental uh, protection. Uh, we're talking about the, the rivers, uh, the big rivers, small rivers, and the lakes have been polluted. Underground water has been polluted as well. Soil is being, uh, has been uh, polluted. So uh, now we see the grains, uh, uh, toxic grains. This is the price of a high GDP. This is not sustainable, cannot be sustained. The, the government has been saying uh, they should uh, change the mode of uh, uh, economic growth. Uh, uh, to, to raise the standards of science and te technology <laughs> instead of uh, increasing the scale. But it's very difficult. Because uh, the government has been claiming this is a uh, market economy with socialist uh, char characteristics. Uh, actually, it is what I call power market economy. Power, the power. Those who are in power controls the market. Yeah. And, and uh, those who are in power uh, uh, is directly involved in the buying and selling of the goods. A lot of our money exchange uh, hands. Every county government is a company. Every, every uh, provincial government is an enterprise, a huge enterprise. So that's why they're increasing the scale. And the government can get cheap loans from the banks. And the Chinese don't have social security. They're very low welfare. So the Chinese, they keep putting money in, their, in the bank. They keep increasing their savings. And the government can, uh, can use the people's savings. We're talking about thousands of billions of yuan. Um, people's savings, and the government just uses it at, at, at its own uh, free will. Uh, for example, the uh, Ministry of Rail, uh, Rail, Railway uh, owes the government uh, uh, um, 1,700 billion yuan. That's why we see this huge growth, uh, huge development of high-speed rails. Well, we're out of time. Oh, I want to thank Mr. Going. Yang. I want to thank our translator, Rose Tang. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it is clear how fortunate we are to believe in the power of ideas. To apply the common sense and the fresh thinking to the Manhattan Institute.